Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Effective Implementation Strategies Reduce Unnecessary Procalcitonin Testing While Improving Outcomes, How to Be an Expert. I am Jennifer Woods of LabRoots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Thermo Fisher Scientific. To learn more, visit procalcitonin.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speaker, Mike Broyles, PharmD, Director of Pharmacy and Laboratory Services at St. Bernard's Five Rivers Medical Center in Arkansas. Dr. Broyles, you may now begin your presentation. Okay, well, thank you very much. And uh, I would like to thank everyone in, you know, Lab Roots and Thermo Fisher for allowing to speak to you to you guys today. I think we'll have a lot of fun and hopefully find some useful information. So objectives today, I would like for you to understand the biochemistry and kinetics of procalcitonin in bacterial infection. So procalcitonin is a test that needs to be understood. And so to apply the concepts is incredibly important to understand. It's not a, a pregnancy test. Yes, no, it's not a, a simple test. And there's a lot of nuances that go along with it. Um, describe how to implement order sets and protocols so that you can optimize test utilization. This is one of the most effective ways to implement the use of procalcitonin. And then explore best practices for a successful procalcitonin adoption um, where you can actually have, be very confident in the clinical outcomes and uh, the use of procalcitonin. And you know, the problem is, is in lab is a lot of times we have a lot of testing that we do. We result a test if it doesn't get acted on, then that's a problem. And so one of the keys is, is that we wanna make sure that when we do this test, that we get the value for it. And that's one of the things that we wanna talk about today. And then we wanna cite the data supporting PCT aided antimicrobial stewardship in lower respiratory tract infections and sepsis. So those are the FDA indications. Why is antibiotic stewardship needed? I'm just gonna spend just a couple of minutes to describe and kind of drive home the point I hope about antimicrobial use. So it is said by the CDC that up to a half of the antibiotics we use in a hospital in the acute care setting is considered inappropriate. And what's interesting about that is that this number has been out there for more than 20 years. And so we know it's a problem and we talk about it, but we really haven't been able to address it. We haven't really made any clinical inroads as far as doing a better job. Now, let me give you an example. So in the recent COVID data, the initial data said 8 to 12 percent had a bacterial co-infection and then that basically 72 to 83 percent received antimicrobial therapy now the only reason to ever give antibiotics in a COVID in, um, patient is if you had a secondary bacterial infection so the original data said 8 to 12 percent but yet almost 9 in 10 got antibiotic therapy and so obviously there's a problem and now we know that the secondary bacterial infection is actually closer to 4%. So we continue to overuse antibiotics. Now, this is an interesting paper that was published. This was in March of this year. And they looked at common prescribing habits in hospitalized patients with gap and urinary tract infection. This was a large sample size, 192 hospitals. And so overall, all indications, they found that 55.9%, I'm going to round if that's okay, 60% of antimicrobial use was considered inappropriate. And in community-acquired pneumonia, it was almost 80%. Again, inappropriate. Think about that. That is four out of five, or basically eight out of 10, depending on how you want to look at that. Urinary tract infection on admission, 76.8 was considered inappropriate. And then when we look at patients prescribed fluoroquinolones, 46.5% got fluoroquinolones when it was not recommended. And then patients prescribed IV vancomycin was 27.3% not recommended. And I actually thought that number would be a little higher. Um, vancomycin is a problem area for me. It's like every, make everybody that comes in has MRSA for some reason. Now, just in case um, you think I'm being a little dramatic, look at these articles. This is article after article after article and after article. These are all recent publications that talks about the overuse of antimicrobials in COVID-19. And basically, the 
think can be said during uh, seasonal influenza back when we actually reported those cases of it. Now, why do we care? Well, we care because it's estimated by the year 2050, the leading cause of death will be antimicrobial resistant bacteria, which it will be in excess of 10 million patients. So this is not gonna happen overnight. It's not like somebody flips a switch, but it's gonna continue to get worse. And so even if you don't die, what happens if you had a scratch in your leg and you ended up being a below the knee amputee or something like that? These are very grave concerns. And then others, there's a lot, there's kidney injury, there's a lot of things. I've just picked a couple. Feed the facility infections, there are now well over half a million uh, uh, hospitalizations due to C. diff each year. And then this, antibiotics increase the re risk of C. difficile associated uh, diarrhea by seven to 10 times while receiving the antibiotics and for up to one month later. So this is a huge concern. Less is better if we can do that. One in six who get infected with C. diff will get it again in the subsequent two to eight weeks. That's very concerning and it gets worse. So in 80% of the deaths occur in these patients who are age 65 or greater and then this is very sobering. Within one month of diagnosis, one in 11 people over the age of 65 died from C. difficile associated diarrhea. It's gravely concerning. So well, then we have to ask our question is, uh, if we know that we're using more antibiotics, why do we do that? And I think the answer is very simple. It's always error in favor of caution. We do it just to be sure. And I think that's a very common thing. And so why are other things? Obviously, there's a lot of indications where we have overlapping clinical symptoms. If you think about congestive heart failure, COPD exacerbations, community-acquired pneumonia, those chest films and some of those things, you basically, you know, it's difficult to know. And then it's also hard to know, is it viral versus bacterial? And that's one of the key concepts. And so think about this. The, P, uh, the problem has always been that biomarkers with low sensitivity and specificity have been around. And so then finally, in the end, we have the overlap of just to be sure because basically all these other things happen. And so if we look at the biomarkers that we commonly have, where we look at white count, we look at sensitivity and specificity. So specificity bacteria for a white count is extremely low. Basically, it's just uh, it's a guess because it's elevated in any circumstance. Sensitivity inflammation, very high. There are 596 drugs or diseases can affect a white count. C-reactive protein is actually more specific, but again, much of the same problems and its kinetics are very different. Lactate has nothing to do with that. I mean, it's a marker of hyperperfusion. Temp, 1180 things that can drive a temp up or down. And so the nice thing is, is that procalcitonin is considered to be 94% specific for bacteria, and that's why it's different. So the question then becomes, we've studied over 1,800 biomarkers for infection. What makes procalcitonin different? And this is a key concept. I just want you to grasp this concept. All parenchymal tissues, so all tissues within the body, have what we call a toll-like receptor. And as you recall, there's all kinds of toll-like receptors. We have at least 12 that have been elucidated. And so as depicted by this little purple nubby, that is the toll-like receptor. And anything bacterial then can affect or activate the toll-like receptor. And once that happens, two things take place. We actually get the immediate release of interleukin-1, interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor, because they are stored in the cell and they are released immediately. So that's where we get that immediate rise in those inflammatory markers that we're so familiar with. The other thing that happens, and is very, very important, is, is that a signal is sent to the cell to make procalcitonin. So this is very important. Procalcitonin is not stored. It has to be made, and that process takes three to six hours. Okay, very, very important point. So once that toll-like -like receptor causes procalcitonin to be geared up and made, usually we can measure it within three to six hours. But the important concept is, is that there is nothing, both the drug and the word state, that can keep you from making procalcitonin. And that's a very important concept. If you have bacteria, you will make procalcitonin. The other thing that's very important is, and remember this toll -like receptor has to be activated by bacteria for it to elevate. And hence from this, we have the inability of viruses to actually elevate PCT. And there's actually a negative feedback mechanism with interferon. So in this situation, procalcitonin is never elevated in a pure viral infection. And so this drives home that concept. Think about this. So for the first time ever, 
if you have to activate the toll like receptor, the more toll like receptors that are activated, the higher the PCT level, the more bacteria you have. And so for the first time ever, we have a tool to tell us about the severity of illness. The other thing is just to drive home the concept is PCT is never elevated in a pure viral infection. It can tell you about the bacterial burden at a point in time. It doesn't reveal the location. We have to find that diagnostically, but that change over time can help us know are our antibiotics working and then oh, do we have opportunities many times to stop sooner? And that's very important. So in the procalcitonin, we would say that a normal value is 0.1 or less. And that's what we're showing here is a normal value. In that 0.1 to 0.5, that's considered a localized infection. There's not a lot of systemic release of PCT. And then most hospitals will report two info alert value, and they report 10 as a critical value. These numbers can go as high as 1,000. We've had people in DIC and necrotizing fasciitis that have been in the 900s, 700s, 550s, and so on. So these values can be very, very high. There's not a magical number which a patient is in sepsis, severe sepsis or septic shock. Okay, that is a syndrome. Okay, the higher the number, the greater cause for concern. So also prognostically, that's very important. The higher the number, and then failure for that PCT to go down is prognostically not good. And so there's a lot of information that can be garnered from the initial PCT value. So kind of in summary, we said that PCT rises in the first three to six hours. That's what we see here. We can see that it's time to peak once that toll-like receptor is activated. It's a biphasic peak. It's basically, say, 24 So once your body sees bacteria, it makes PCT for 24 hours. Its elimination half-life is also 24 hours. So this is really nice. It's easy to remember these numbers. And then based on its elimination half-life, the most effective time to evaluate the therapy and the effectiveness of your therapy is also 24 hours. So rises in three to six, peaks in 24, elimination half-life 24, best time to evaluate the effectiveness of your therapy is also 24. So what you can actually see, for instance, if we had a PCT value of 10, we apply appropriate antibiotic therapy, 24 hours passes, then what we would what would we expect the PCT value to be? Well, we would expect it to be about half because it goes down by about half every 24 hours, okay? So the role of procalcitonin in stewardship, okay? Um, antimicrobial stewardship, quite simply, is the appropriate use of antibiotics. We need to know a couple of things. Is this infection viral or bacterial? Because PCT is never elevated in viral infection, so very useful. If it's bacterial, do we need antibiotics? Just because you have a bacterial infection, if PCT is very low, it doesn't require the use of antibiotics, okay? It can help you establish bacterial burden or the severity of infection, and then you can help you evaluate, are the antibiotics the correct choice with two serial measurements? Are my antibiotics working? And then many times, how long to treat? Can I stop early based on an absolute value or an 80% reduction? So. This is why um, the body requires bacteria to make PCT. That's an important concept. Just an inflammatory response only does not cause PCT to be made, and that's very important. <clears throat> so let's use, I'm going to just show you two case studies and give you some value of PCT. So this is an interesting case. It's a 56-year-old male construction worker in asthma since childhood. So smoker, very important. Uh, chief complaints, shortness of uh, breath, productive cough, malaise, and fever. This has been going on for a while. And, of course, he got his ZPAC because everybody gets a ZPAC. The steroids were for his asthma. So when he presents, the temp's not bad. Blood pressure's normal. Pulse is 90. Respiratory rate's 20. He's 92% on room air with a white count of just 14, 7, 6% bands. Chest film says, though, early bilateral pneumonia. So the plan was to put him on levofloxacin. Now, let me ask you a question. If I told you his PCT on admission was 0.7, remember that 0.1-ish you know, to 0.5 is fairly low, 2 is alert, 10 is critical. 0.7 doesn't seem that bad. <clears throat> now, if I told you his PCT was 15, where you know 2 is alert, 10 is a critical value, does it seem like he has a lot more bacteria? And at this point in time with our discussion, I hope your answer would be yes. And so this is why you do PCT in the ED. It's very important to get the baseline, and it tells you something about the initial severity of assessment. Now, in this case, we're actually going to start at 0.7, okay? 
we can see his PCT is 0.7. He was placed on levofloxacin, right? Now, the next day, notice what happens in the blue. The PCT goes from 0.7 to 36. Now, this had been right at 24 hours, and this was um, years ago. We've been using PCT for 11 years. And I've looked at a lot of PCT values, and so when uh, we went to the clinician early on, we said, you know, PCT has gone up very significantly. This is huge cause for concern. Can we please change therapy? And he would not do that. He said, I look at the patient. He just needs more time for the antibiotics to work. Well, the antibiotics, if they don't begin to work in 24 hours, they're never going to work. That's one thing that you can bank on. And that was unfortunate because the next day what happened is his PCT went from 36 to 86. At that point in time, we actually changed his therapy and he was placed on meropen and vancomycin. So this was, this was very concerning. Obviously, had we not waited that 24 hours to change his therapy, things might have been different with him. And so then we actually had a sputum that was positive or gram-positive lancet-shaped uh, diplococci, same for blood cultures with a lot of white cells. So obviously we think we know what's going on here. He probably has a strep pneumo. And then um, one of the things we did do is we repeated that PCT in 12 hours, which we don't normally do. But in this case, we wanted to make sure that it was trending down. And then day three, we can actually see it actually went from 86 to 46. That's over 24-hour time frame telling us our antibiotics are working. And so <clears throat> very interesting then, sputum uh, was positive for streptococcus pneumoniae. So this is blood cultures. Now, with levofloxacin, we normally are 97, 98%. But I guess he was one of the ones that was not within that range. And so he was one of the, you know, the 2 or 3%. And so as we follow this out, you can see that the PCT continued to go down by about half. And then based on the FDA, FDA algorithm, you can actually stop antibiotics when you have an 80% reduction in PCT. And so that would be at, at the end of day five. There's really no need to continue to uh, give this man antibiotics. You don't have to go longer than that in this case. Now, let me give you um, and make it very clear. The diagnosis of pneumonia is based on the three pillars or the symptoms that of clinical symptoms, tissue infiltrates, um, you know, inflammation, suspicion of infection. PCT does not have to be hugely elevated, but there are certain, certain, certain circumstances where about a third of your patients will have PCT that's basically around point. The reason is, is that the nidus or the infection within the lung can be fairly small. And one of the things is, is that atypical organisms, mycoplasma, chlamydia, chlamydia, pneumonia, because they're atypical, they do not induce a lot of PCT. So obviously it's not that common of infection, but in those situations, you don't have a hugely elevated PCT. But anytime you have a significant elevation in PCT, it doesn't go down after the first 24 hours, we need to think in terms of stopping or changing therapy. Now, this is kind of an interesting thing. I'm gonna put this in perspective for you uh, as far as other markers and the, the information that can PCT can give you. So um, this lady was admitted, 67-year-old female, mild mental confusion. She complained of basically everything. Um, you know, she was very nonspecific. Um, everything she had hurt because she had fibromyalgia, okay, very common complaint. She had a long history of recurrent urinary tract infections, uh, hypertension, migraine, and depression, not otherwise specified. So generalized anxiety, these people typically are very somatic and typically have a long med list. And so this is the UA, okay? We have one plus leukocyte esterase, four to six white cells, bacteria is two plus, and she had this uh, very um, concentrated, dark, uh, nasty urine. Now, we have a white count, though, that's 9.6. 62% neutrophils, and we have a PCT that's 0.05. Now, she's not a good historian. She can't really tell us what's going on. And so what's interesting is, is that in the elderly patients, particularly those in the nursing home, 40% of those patients are colonized. They're always going to have a UA that looks like they're infected. And so this is where you can have value to PCT because in a patient who's colonized, PCT will not elevate. And so this is what we're actually seeing. So here's what happened, though. This is the story. So patient was admitted. PCT is normal. Blood pressure is normal. They were placed on ceftriaxone. Now, the next day, the blood pressure dropped to 90 over 58. So if you come in, you're a clinician, 
and you see this, the first thing you're going to think is what? Yeah, you're going to think that this patient has urosepsis. And so the gut lactate is 2.7, and then though the PCT is still normal. I can tell you that if you have two negative PCT values, there's a 99% probability you do not have a bacterial infection from any shape, form, or fashion. And so what's kind of interesting is I got a call from the clinician. We had the discussion, and they insisted on stopping the ceftriaxone, putting on piptase and topramycin because they were worried about this because she had a long history of urinary tract infections. I said, you know, the thing is, she doesn't need this. There's something else going on. But hypotension and lactate always equals what? In people's minds, it equals sepsis. And that's unfortunate because that's not always the case. So we have 10 hours later, blood pressure is still the same. The lactate is now 4.3. And there really wasn't another PCT order, but I went and got one. And we pulled it just to drive home the point. You now have three negative PCTs. There's no way in the world this is a bacterial infection. But the discussion was, I want to start adding, I want to add vancomycin. Well, vancomycin, you know, it, it just wasn't necessary. So a long story short, what actually happened is, is that we actually got a troponin. The troponin was significantly elevated, as was the EKG. And this lady had to go to the cath lab. She was actually having acute MI. And so because she couldn't tell us, and because she really was non-symptomatic, we were getting information from PCT that was telling us that this is not a bacterial infection. And remember, um, hypotension alone is not the only indicator. Uh, I mean, um, you know, sepsis is not the only indicator of of an elevation in lactate. It can come from acute MI. It can come from heart failure and other things. And so this helps us put this in perspective. So let's talk a little bit about the implementation secrets for success. The goal is, is to give you a test that will improve the clinical outcomes for your patients, and yet you get the biggest bang for the buck. And so one of the things that we have to realize is that you're dealing with human nature. And this is a very hard, because getting people to start antibiotic therapy is like pulling a pacifier from somebody's mouth, I mean, a baby's mouth. It is a hard thing to do. And many times they don't see any need to change or they're afraid to change. Uh, and they don't want to, even though they knew it, know it's the right thing to do. And and then, you know, obviously there's those people that know know more than you do. So the question is, well, why change? And so we have to think in terms of changing behavior. How, what can we do to do that? And this is where we're at. We have to provide enough objective evidence that there's not an infection that requires the use of antibiotics. So is this viral versus bacterial? We have to prove that Stopping antibiotics earlier is safe, and it's safe in lower sepsis and lower respiratory tract infections, and we've done that. There's tons of literature on that. Stopping earlier also, we have to prove, will not result in readmissions. One of the hardest things for my clinicians was with stopping is they said my 30-day readmission rate is going to go up, and that was not the case. It was actually half as much, and they had a hard time dealing with that. And then we have to under make them understand that the outcomes can actually be better and it is best for the patient and for themselves and the hospital. So implementation strategies. Try to partner with the antimicrobial stewardship committee. It involves a lot of folks. You have your physicians, you have uh, pharmacy, you have infection control, you have laboratory, you have uh, quality. You have all those people there together and they can help drive better outcomes. And so that's important. The key players are in the pharmacy and the antimicrobial stewardship committee. We as pharmacists are tasked with the antimicrobial stewardship overview and having to have those committees in place. That is our primary focus. It's very helpful if you have a champion, somebody who is on board with PCT and will push and will push. That's very useful. But the most successful indicator is education. As I say, PCT has a lot of nuances, and we haven't even began to talk about the nuances. We just kind of gave just basically the background information with PCT. So the easiest way to make people understand how to use PCT is through case studies. Um, that is the only way clinicians will get it, and it's very important to do that. And then you want to broaden the education with special nuances. What does it do in autoimmune disease? What does it do in chronic kidney failure? What does it do in acute kidney failure? What does it do in surgery and all these special nuances to make people understand and give them the knowledge? 
I would suggest that you don't start in the ICU. Many people want to start in the ICU because it's smaller and it seems more controllable. But remember, the people in the ICU are sicker, and the sicker people are, the harder it is to get people to stop antibiotics. So kind of important if you think about that. Again, the key is education, education, education. Every time I've seen PCT not do well, it's failure to get the clinicians properly trained. And that's one of the key concepts. I'll just say it again, the, in way, the best way is to be antimicrobial stewardship committee and start your testing in the ED. We just did a case study where you could see that it's important. PCT is a serial test. Nobody runs one troponin. You don't want one PCT. So start it in the ED, and then you're going to follow it when they get admitted. So you're always going to run two serial measurements. You're always going to have two PCTs if they're admitted to the hospital, the first one, and then one 24 hours later. That's very, very important. So the other piece is, is that of ordering. So that helps if you have protocolized ordering and if you have PRN ordering. And what I mean by that is, is that you basically have protocols to treat patients. You have maybe a community acquired pneumonia, uh, a community acquired pneumonia protocol. You have a sepsis protocol. You have these protocols and they have things ordered, everything that you need to do. And it has ordered the, what processes need to be ordered and how often. And it's a lot easier if you put PCT in your order sets. And also the PR in ordering is also thinking about who's going to order PCT and follow up P when, with PCT when it didn't get ordered correctly. And that will happen sometimes. So establish your algorithms, your protocols, begin with sepsis and lower respiratory tract infection. That's the FDA approved indications. And make sure that you get the correct interval. There is no need to do a PCT on admission and do one six hours later. Remember, the ideal time is 24 hours after the initial PCT. I don't want you to do initial testing that you don't have to do. We want to get the biggest bang for your, uh, for your buck. And so, again, make sure that somebody is making sure that there's the appropriate interval and that somebody is looking at every test, and that's very important, and that they can act on those tests. And the, one of the ways to do that is through protocols and for auto-stop considerations. We actually have a protocol in place that says two negative PCTs or an 80% reduction in sepsis and lower respiratory tract infections, we auto-stop. We do the same thing in, uh, in patients who have uh, urinary tract infections or who um, got started on the antibiotics and have a negative PCT because they're colonized. So these are opportunities to streamline your process and to be more effective. And of course, it's best if you put these in your electronic order sets to make sure that you have consistency and compliance. One of the easiest things to do when you stop PCT early is to give confidence to your clinicians is to order a PCT the next day. So let's say, for instance, that today I have an 80% reduction in PCT on a community-acquired pneumonia or a COPD exacerbation. Antibiotics are stopped today. Order a PCT tomorrow, for, and you can do this for a while, and it makes them feel comfortable in knowing that the PCT is not going up. It won't go up, I can tell you, within one to two, with, well, with a 98 to 99% certainty, it'll never go up. But until they understand that, till they see it, you can order a PCT the next day to make them feel more comfortable. It's also recommended to share the outcomes when you have better outcomes, because what you're actually gonna see is you're gonna have better clinical outcomes, way fewer antibiotics, and a lot less cost. And you need to share that to drive home your, um, basically your successes. And you need to report these outcomes. They can go in P&T, they can go into your stewardship, they can go into quality, but basically there's a lot of opportunities for you to share that information. And then again, to re-educate. Re this is always gonna be a continuing process because you always have people who are coming in who are new, okay, who have been hired, who have no use, had you know no experience with PCT. Um, you have people who come in and you know basically they don't see the value because they came from somewhere that they didn't see the value. They didn't look at it, but they just thought it was you know because somebody else did it was okay. 
A key concept is this, is that believe the test is very reliable and it's much more objective than simply looking at a patient, a critically ill patient, two negative PCTs, I can tell you that you do not have a bacterial infection. I understand the need to want to continue, but it provides you with a lot of information. Again, many diagnoses have very similar symptoms. The question comes down to, do we need antibiotics in these patients? So this is the FDA-approved indication. It says to aid in decision-making on antibiotic discontinuation for patients with suspected or confirmed sepsis, and to aid in decision-making on antibiotic therapy for inpatients of patients in ED with lower respiratory tract infections, which they define, define as CAP, COPD, exacerbations, and acute bronchitis. And this is actually the algorithm that came with the FDA approval, which, by the way, only took three months. And so here's the initiation. So, for instance, if you had a COPD exacerbation, PCT came in at, say, 0.2, therapy is discouraged. Your body has the ability to fight off that infection. But if PCT comes in at 0.26 to 0.5, it's encouraged and always strongly encouraged around the 0.5. Antibiotic discontinuation, again, lower respiratory tract infections, an absolute value of 0.25 or an 80% drop. And in sepsis, 0.5 or an 80% drop. And notice the wording. This is the FDA's wording. Cessation strongly encouraged with clinical improvement. Okay. Now, you cannot stop early in all indications. You can't stop early in endocarditis, osteomyelitis, skin and skin structure infections, and those who are on chemotherapy or, you, uh, or people who have MRSA bacteremia because you're actually trying to prevent uh, endocarditis. But it can be stopped in these patients. So let's answer questions here. So with the IDSA CAP uh, guidelines recommending against the use of PCT for initiation, are there scenarios where it might be useful in CAP? And I think here's the question. Let me ask you guys the question. So if 50% of CAP is viral, which we know it is, right, does it seem good to treat everyone with five days of antibiotics? That's what they kind of actually said. Start antibiotics on everybody because nothing has the sensitivity to tell us. Does that make sense? Knowing that one half of those patients have a viral infection, I think you would agree. The answer is no. It doesn't make any sense at all. Now, if a bacterial infection is confirmed, you're very comfortable, does it seem like five days of antibiotics is the perfect duration for all patients with these infections? And I think the answer you would say would be no. In fact, based on our data with PCT guidance and over, over several thousand patients, I can tell you that a, PC, a uh, antibiotic duration of five days based on PCT guidance is appropriate or is the right duration 13% of the time. The remaining part of the time you're giving antibiotics too long or too short. And so that's very important to think about. If you grow an organism from the sputum or from a bronch, should you always treat that organism that you identify? Our lungs are colonized, they're full of bacteria. So the question becomes, just because you grow an organism, should you treat it? I fight this all the time. I'll have somebody, they'll say, um, I, I grew out of pseudomonas, I grew out of MRSA. If the PCT is normal, I'm saying you have identified a colonized organ, organism, let's not treat them. And so there's a lot of value here. So this was actually from a Medscape review article, and this is what it said. Pinpointing the source of infection in community-acquired uh, pneumonia can be a daunting task that more often than not results in failure. Although streptococcus pneumonia are the most frequently isolated bacterial pathogens, they are no longer the most common cause of CAP. Pay attention to this. In fact, despite extensive testing, no pathogen is detected in 60% of patients with CAP. Even when a pathogen is isolated, it's usually a virus, a rhino, influenza, or human metanumovirus. And this is due in part to the use of vaccines. So this is very, very important if you think about it. So now I would hope you would agree then that the environment has changed and it allows us opportunities to avoid prescribing in antibiotics in patients who have pure viral infections. And so again, this just circles back around, considering and consider starting antibiotics in the diagnosis of CAP, but discontinue with a second normal value or an 80% reduction in the maximal PCT value. And that's a good, uh, uh, rule to go by. So this was actually from the two co-authors of the 
most recent ATS IDSH chest guidelines. And this, I'm going to just circle in on the, uh, hone in on the bottom statement. Before the COVID-19 pandemic, the inflammatory biomarker procalcitonin was shown to safely reduce antibiotic use in patients with CAP. And this is what we've always known. And they uh, brought this up. So what about sepsis? Let's talk about sepsis. So since PCT is not specifically listed in the surviving sepsis EMS guidelines, why should we use it? Let's think about that. So again, poll question. Patients meeting sepsis criteria are required to have antibiotics started immediately regardless of PCT value. Is that true? Yeah, unfortunately, it is, okay, which is kind of silly, all right, because there's a big difference between sepsis, severe sepsis, and septic shock. Now, if 40% of those patients meeting sepsis criteria need antibiotics and 60% don't, why would we continue to give antibiotics in those patients? And it's true. People who meet the sepsis criteria because that criteria was set so long. It makes no sense to give these people continued antibiotics. And you can safely stop antibiotics in sepsis patients 24 hours after the initial value uh, and then weighs 0.5 or reduced 80% from the maximum value. And I hope you would say yes, based on our discussion. So. Think about this. We're required to start antibiotics based on the current guidelines, although I wish that would definitely change. 40% of the patients meeting sepsis criteria actually need antibiotics. It's always PCT can help you in that viral versus bacterial decision. It can help you in the initial severity assessment. It can tell you if your antibiotics are working and provide opportunities for early cessation. So Kind of the last section is this, does it work? Does it save you money? Does it improve clinical outcomes? So this was a paper that I published in Open Forum Infectious Disease. It was the impact of calcitonin guided antibiotic management on antibiotic exposure and outcomes. And this is real world evidence. So in our study, what you will see is, is that we had 2,152 patients, 985 were in our control group, 1,167 were in our study group. Overall, the days of therapy, which is the most accurate measurement of antibiotics that you can do, we reduced 47%. Now, that's on top of a mature stewardship program that had been in place for more than 17 years. So, again, we reduced antibiotic exposure 47%, which I think is very interesting. We reduced hospital all-course mortality by 62%, hospital mortality from infection 59%, and people look at that and they go, well, that seems high. Well, now think about this, put it in perspective. Hospital mortality in U.S. hospitals is 2%. 2 in 100 people die. If you simply go from 2 in 100 to 1 in 100, you just reduce mortality by 50%. So it's very doable. This was a big thing. 30-day all-cause readmissions were reduced 50%. Readmission from infection, 49%. And so this is kind of interesting because what you can see is, is that we used half as many antibiotics but we had twice as good outcomes. So people will go, how can that be? More is always better. No, what is better is, is the right amount. And that's where we're at at this point in time. So hospital C. difficile infections were reduced 64%. And that's very important because you can lose 1% of your Medicare money if your C. difficile rate is too high. And then we saved 50% on adverse events from antimicrobials. And that can be in a very large number if you think about it. So we presented the data and of course one of the first things they said well what about the money and so we did analysis on that we broke it down by sepsis and we broke it down by lrti and so what you actually can see is is that we actually reduced antimicrobial expenditures almost 55 percent okay we reduced laboratory cost by 32 percent so even running 3.1 pcts per patient i still save the laboratory money get that think about that it's the big concept and then mechanical ventilation costs were reduced almost 53 percent and then uh, we looked at uh, uh, c difficile infections was 30 36 percent so overall that is a 49 percent reduction in cost of the patient now i think in our society we look at numbers all the time and we don't appreciate numbers so let me ask you a question if you went to buy a car today or a truck and you went and the sticker price said 
$55. And the guy walks up to you, you know, the slick car salesman, and he says, today you can have that car for $25,621. Would that get your attention? Well, yeah, because that applies to us. It's real money. That is very important when you think of that. That is a huge difference. We did the same thing for lower respiratory tract infections. Again, antibiotic exposures, almost 47%. A laboratory cost, almost 22%. And C. difficile, 19%. And still, that's almost a 25% reduction overall. So it's very significant. Now, let me just show you one more article. This is the meta-analysis that we published of 13 articles in the U.S. And I'm showing you this because you could say, well, my hospital is a one-off, okay? So this was a meta-analysis that was done in the U.S., and it, we looked at the same thing. We broke it down by sepsis and LRTI. And what you can see is reduced overall antibiotic days of therapy, almost six days, so very significant. Again, when we looked at C. difficile infection, 16000 16, we looked at antibiotics, $333. We looked at mechanical ventilation cost $2,100, $86 for lab testing, and $11,310 overall. The same thing with lower respiratory tract infections, almost a five-day reduction. That's very significant when it's only 11.9 to start with. And then we looked at C. difficile infections, very significant in this population group because it's involved a lot of patients receiving lots of antibiotics. And antibiotics, again, minus 290, Mechanical ventilation, minus 221. Laboratory testing was kind of a wash. It was actually slightly higher in this group. And then overall, uh, almost $2,900. So very significant. So uh, I would like to open it up to questions now. I uh, will take any questions and uh, just send those in, and we'll, we'll discuss those. Thank you, Dr. Broyles, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you would like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is, excuse me, is how will PCT be used during flu season? Yeah, so that's a great question. So in flu season, just like with COVID, the only need for PCT, uh, the only need for antibiotics is if you have a secondary bacterial infection. So the role of PCT in flu season is simply to rule out a secondary bacterial infection. The reason that's important is patients who have a secondary bacterial infection in COVID and seasonal influenza have a 4.7 uh, time, times greater likelihood of severity and illness and death. So the, the role is basically to rule out a secondary bacterial infection. And seasonal influenza in flu is generally much higher as far as the rate than it is in uh, COVID-19. All right. Thank you, Dr. Broyles. The next question is, what are other causes of elevated PCT? Sure. That's a great question. So there, there are things that elevate PCT. And what you have to understand, and I tell people, I think this is the easiest way to look at it. PCT is elevated when bacteria is where it doesn't belong, okay? And by the, what I mean by that is, so if you have a colon resection, you get bacteria in the peritoneal ca cavity, it's fairly common to have PCT values around one for the first day or two. Even in patients who have uh, transplants, so whether it be a heart, uh, lung, kidney, it's normal to have PCT values of two, up to 10 in liver, but they go down in the next 48 hours. In cytokine storm, you can actually have very large elevations in PCT. And people say, well, the inflammatory response drives that elevation of PCT. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't. So that is due to an indirect response. What happens is in all these situations is you get translocation of bacteria from places that doesn't belong. Our lungs are full of bacteria. If you translocate bacteria, they get into the bloodstream. Our gut, we know very clearly that in ischemic events, hugely inflammatory responses that, that a lot of bacteria gets translocated. And the same thing with the liver, there's a lot of bacteria there. So those are some situations. Stills, what, uh, cells, Wagner's, Good Pastures, Onca, those are autoimmune responses where you can see elevations in PCT and the normal value is 0.5 versus 0.05. The same thing in people who are on dialysis, 
30% of procalcitonin is excreted greenly. The remaining 70% is enzymatically degraded. So a normal value in PCT in those patients is going to be 0.5 or less. You just simply have a new value. So you just think in terms of what causes PCT to be elevated. You can, you can, and there's obviously a lot of situations where, uh, where that can happen because of the inflammatory response. Next question. We're having some audio trouble with our moderator here. I'm just going to go okay. on to the next question I see. Um, is there utility for PCT in the diagnosis of neonatal sepsis? Yeah, this is a great question. So what this comes down to is this situation is that is that um, after the first 48 hours, PCT values are exactly the same as they are in adults, and they respond and the values are exactly the same. Now, what is interesting is in that in the first 48 hours after delivery, PCT values can be very high, and there's actually an algorithm that you can go to that will tell you, for instance, at 24 hours, the PCT value of 24 is normal. And why that is is that simply you have an infant who is in a sterile environment who is now put in a situation where they're bombarded by bacteria. And so their body is actually seeing bacteria that it's never seen before. And so in those situations, you literally can go to an algorithm and know if it's elevated or not. Now, it's going to be high, okay, but the algorithm will tell you, and it does provide value. At the end of 48 hours, uh, PCT will be normal. And so it's just kind of an interesting, interesting situation. All right, thank you, Dr. Broyles. Our next question here, let's see, is there utility for, you just answered this one, I believe, for neonatal uh, PCT and the diagnosis of neonatal right. sepsis? Okay, I'm sorry, I had some technical difficulties and had to log back in, so I'm catching up. The next question, how did added PCT, um, adding PCT to your existing order set, help the physicians use this test? Yeah, so putting on the existing order sets when used appropriately is going to do several things. It's going to tell them is the bacterial infection because it will not be elevated in viral infections. When the white count may be through the roof or unelevated, you never know. It's going to tell them then based on the level, what's its initial severity assessment. Based on the second uh, PCT test, it's going to tell you are your antibiotics working? And then also it can provide you with opportunities to stop antibiotics sooner. And so a lot of information from one or two PCT values, putting it into the order sets makes sure that it gets ordered. I can tell you the other day we had um, a patient that it didn't get ordered. For, I don't know what happened. We actually have them in the order sets. And so um, when I went to check on the patient, there was no PCT value. And this was a lung infection, and, you know, it's in our order set. I don't know how it got taken off. But nonetheless, the PCT was 141. Well, 141 in a lung infection is huge. And I can assure you that when we looked at that patient from that point on, our impression of that patient was much different than it was before. So the key is, is that if you get those in your order sets, you routinely get uh, PCTs ordered you routinely look at them and it, you routinely have an opportunity to act on the test value. All right, thank you, Dr. Boyles. Our next question here, can you share insights on how the education helped physicians? Did it help to shift their position on PCT utility? Sure, well, yes. So um, human nature is, is that um, we tend not to believe anything that seems too good to be true. I mean, and so one of the things is that you run into is if somebody came from a situation and say they didn't use PCT and, and they just did what came where, wherever they came from. So that's one of the situations is, is that people say, well, I didn't use it. Well, why didn't you use it? Well, I don't know. I just didn't use it. And so what you have to do is you have to provide enough evidence that they can trust the test. 
So what we did is we had, uh, I did noon luncheons. So that was one of the things that was common because my physicians don't like to do dinners. And so we did noon luncheons and we had multiple presentations. I think I've had three the first time when we were initiating the, the test. And then what I did is, is I turned over to them and had them do case studies. Well, now the thing is, if it's a case study, they want theirs to be better than somebody else. But you have to get them to use the test till they get the aha moment. The first aha moment that they'll get is, is when the patient's not doing well and PCT goes up and they'll change it and then they'll see it going down. The second aha moment is when they realize that they can actually stop sooner um, when they didn't think they could. But, you know, the education component, you, you know, because everybody's looking for a reason just to do what they've always done. And for them, it's always easier to just give more antibiotics. Unfortunately, that's not what in the, is what is in the best interest of our patients and in them and the hospitals. Thank you, Dr. Boyle. Our next question here. Do you know how many PCT tests on average are done per patient when standardizing a PCT testing protocol like this? And how often do you uh, recommend do, do th how often do you recommend doing them? Yeah, so that depends on where you're at. So we averaged in the data that I presented as far as our clinical outcomes, we averaged 3.1 PCTs. Now, what I would suggest is is that we handle ICU versus non-ICU slightly differently. So our length of stay in non-ICU patients is 2.9 days. So what we actually did is our protocol says we get one daily. So that could be four, okay? Now, what we do is, though, is that in situations where we have two negative PCTs, then we cancel the remaining tests. So we don't just continue, you know, to order the test, but we put those in there just to make sure that they don't get missed so that they're available for rounds. Now, ICU is a different story. You know, we will always do two, and then we'll just do those as needed, if that, if that makes sense. But um, generally, you know, two or three. What I would suggest, if you, you have people that have community-acquired pneumonia, COPD exacerbations, or sepsis, you get the first two. You know kinetically it's going to go down by about half every day, the PCT value. And so then you know when to order that last PCT, which will then be the 80% reduction. So you can generally get by with three tests in most situations. Thank you again, Dr. Boyles. Our next question here. Is there the potential to reduce or use other lab tests differently? For example, what do you recommend for the repeat frequency for CBC and differential, possibly daily? And also, same question for lactate. Yeah, so that, that is a great question. So lactate's its own marker. It's really not affected. Lactate is simply a, a marker of perfus perfusion. But now, if you think in terms of the white count, um, really, you know, you have the opportunity to not order as many white counts because the PCT, once you determine to be bacterial, you have the opportunity maybe to consider not doing as many. Now, I think a lot of our clinicians go ahead and order one anyway. Um, but I don't really understand why we do that. There's really not a need for that, and I think there's an opportunity. Um, we kind of do the same thing. Obviously, we're going to get blood cultures the way we are, but there are studies that have indicated that if PCT is 0.5 or less, um, there's probably no need to do a blood culture. But, you know, um, that's just an opportunity. All right. Thanks again, Dr. Broyles. We've got uh, one more question here. Do you think do you think you will need to follow up um, training for physicians, and if so, what time point? Oh, the answer is absolutely yes. So what I do is two things. I look at where it was. I will have training if it gets used inappropriately, and then we have training when we bring new people in. So we actually have a video. We put it on a. Uh, we made a video so that they can actually watch it and they can go through that to um, to familiarize themselves, particularly in the ED. So we have a lot of you know ED physicians that uh, rotate through, and so we provide that for them. And then the hospitals, we we provide that for them to to uh, look at. But the answer is yes. I mean, the the continuing education never goes away. I mean, you would want it to, you would hope it would, but you always bring in people that are not familiar 
And what I do is, again, is if they're using it inappropriately, then it's time for education. Great. Thank you again, Dr. Broyles. Um, looks like that was all we had time for. Do you have any final comments for our audience before we go? No, I just uh, I just hope that you give it a chance and that you look at it. It's a huge, te a huge test, um, you know, and cost effective. I mean, you know, I, it depends on what, you know, your contract pricing is, but the test of 15 ish dollars, um, you know, it's it's very cost effective and it can make a huge difference. I mean, we did we did laboratory optimization started back in 1992 and we we did everything that we knew to do with the laboratory testing. And PCT still reduced antibody use 49%. So that's huge. Um, and once you get to use it, you'll never go with anywhere without it. Every time I have a physician that leaves, the first thing I do is I get it. They get call me up and they said, "Would you do education for us for PCT? We need to bring it on here." And that's what happens when you use it. You'll develop a great deal of confidence in your test, and you don't want to be without it because it definitely can make a huge difference. Thank you again to our speaker, Dr. Mike Broyles, for your time today and for your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>